Hi guys, and welcome back to The Carla Garrick Show. Today is episode 23, and I'll be kicking off a three-part series of an interview I did on The Honest Offense uh, last fall. The series is called From the Apartheid State to the Free State. And so this three-part series will give you a pretty good sense of who I am, what my story is, the history of the Free State Project, and more. In today's episode, which is part one, you'll learn a little bit more about my personal history, um, something about the history of South Africa, including, sadly, the British concentration camps, and also why I don't have a typical South African accent. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this part one of the series from the apartheid state to the free state. And uh, we'll be doing part two and part three over the next few weeks. I hope you enjoy it. I love getting feedback, so if you want to reach out to me, you can always email me at carla at carlagarrick.com. Remember to hit that subscribe button when it comes up. And thank you again for joining me for The Carla Garrick Show. Enjoy episode 23. Here we go. Uh, and remember, together we can live free and thrive. everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Honest Defense. Today, I am honored to be joined by Carla Garrick. Carla is a lawyer, an author, an activist. She does it all. She's the author of the book, The Ecstatic Pessimist. It's a collection of essays that Carla's written. It's speeches she's given, opinion pieces. There's some biographical writing in there. It's just a great, it's a really unique collection of, of writing. Carla's an excellent writer. She's got a fascinating life story. Uh, she's, she's done some really incredible stuff. So I'm so excited to have you here, Carl, and to get into all the all the stuff you've done in your fascinating life. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, Eric. And I, I was telling you before we started recording, we met at Freedom Fest. We were introduced by our mutual friend, the hilarious Lou Perez. Yes. And uh, you know, we we had a we had a, a pretty lengthy conversation. I walked away from that thinking, wow, she's she's really interesting. I I would love to get her on the podcast. And then I got your book. I started reading even more about you, and I realized I I we only talked about a small fraction of what you've done. So I'm I'm so excited to get into all of this. First thing is I have to ask you about the title of your book. And this usually – titles I, I usually don't, don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but you're stuck with me because something resonated. Because when I think about big picture ideas, I, I tend to get pessimistic when I'm thinking big picture and long term. But just on a day-to-day -day basis, there's so, there's so much that I do get excited about, and, and ecstatic might be the right word. But I, I was curious where you came up with that title, if that's, if that's kind of where that came from or if I'm just putting my own – spin on it no and that's a great question i mean in some ways because i think that we manifest our own futures i i think that if i could do a b testing i would love to make it the ecstatic optimist right. and the ecstatic pessimist and sort of see how that plays out but the original title comes from a short story it was an award-winning short story that was published many years ago uh as you mentioned lou perez lou and i actually went to, uh, and did our MFAs together at City College. So that's how I know him. And I actually turned him on to like Ron Paul and all yeah. of that. So I'm gonna take credit for turning him as one might say. <laughs> um, so the title was The Ecstatic Pessimist. And it's actually, um, it's a story about an alcoholic who's having problems with his uh, partner and she actually leaves him because he's unwilling to start uh, stop drinking. And in many ways, that's sort of a little bit personal in the sense that that was a journey I took for myself. So I just really like the words together. But I think that, you know, I've changed over the 10 years since that story was written. And I think maybe I wanted to get it out of my system, you know, to be like, okay, this is done. This is a part of my life. I really wanted to get the collection out and just, you know, I, I'm working on another book. I know there's a book after that. People are like, three memoirs, Carla. I'm like, yes, damn it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so it, in some ways, I wonder if I should have stuck to that. I have some people who are like, you know, do you want to put pessimism out in the world? Because that's obviously very counter to my own like energy. But I think it was it, it was a saying goodbye to a part of me, and and it's a catchy name, and and you know, and people. I I put up one of those polls, and it seemed to resonate with a lot of people. So maybe that was why it resonated with you as well. No, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, you know, we we liberty people and people who sort of live with liberty values forward. This is obviously a bit of a trying time. I think I would be more pessimistic, honestly, if I wasn't here with the Free State Project in New Hampshire, because I feel like, OK, there are things that, you know, we should be worried about. Right. But I feel like I'm working towards solutions and not just focusing on the problems. And I think that's the healthiest view to have because there are people who just don't want there to be any negativity. They say, why would you even use the word pessimism? We should just be all positivity. And to me, that always comes off as inauthentic. I mean, there's always something you're you're worried about, you're concerned about. And so to me, I, I don't I don't feel like I need to hide any kind of pessimism I have or any kind of negative feelings. But like you said, it's as long as you're working towards something, as long as in your kind of day to day life you can see the positives and, and have something beneficial. It, it's okay to, to put out there, hey, I'm not feeling that great about this. That To me, that's just real. Right, and I think also the, the contrast of the words, right, ecstatic and right. pessimist or ecstatic and optimist. Ecstatic optimist actually wouldn't work, right? right. You could, right. It, it just, it's already written in right. there. So, so it's that notion of balance, and that's really something, you know, the positive and the negative, uh, the yin and the yang, all of that, right, is something that I think we are losing sight of yeah. <laughs> in general. And whenever I look at things in life, I kind of go, well, how can, like, Where's the balance in this? And so I like it for that reason as well. Right, right. So let's go to the very beginning. I want to hear about growing up in South Africa. And I want to hear, can you talk to me a little bit about apartheid? Because that, you know, there's now a generation of, of people who are growing up who have no idea what, the, I mean, it, Nelson Mandela was freed, I think, when I was an infant. Uh, and so there's kind of a part of history that's not really taught in schools in America. We don't really know much about it. Can you explain what it was like growing up there? Sure. So apartheid was a, uh, in its literal translation in Afrikaans means uh, kept apart, right? Separate. And the notion was sort of like separate but equal, but like in a really, really shady way right, that, right. you know, was not reality. Uh, basically, the, the long and the short of it is... Uh, Boers who were farmers, who were mostly Dutch, went to South Africa in the, between the 16 and the 1800s. No one was enslaving anyone. People, you know, traded for land. It, it was all pretty kosher. And then those sneaky, sneaky little Englishmen <laughs> were like, hmm, you guys have some stuff we want, like gold and diamonds and all of that. And so uh, they came in, they came in with, you know, colonialism, the, the sun will never set on the empire kind of mentality. And there were actually two Boer wars uh, or, you know, wars of independence. So that was the, the more British and that's sort of my background. Uh, my family, you know, we came from Europe, but we weren't British. So there were a couple of wars uh, that happened at the turn of the 18th, 19th century. And something that a lot of Americans don't know, or frankly, anyone in the world knows, is the first place there were ever concentration camps that were used, like, uh, you know, as, as a form in war was actually during the Boer War. And the British put Boer women and children in concentration camps, and they killed 20 Fifty-five percent of uh, of all women and children, which will have an impact, of course, on your society. So that, needless to say, didn't make the Afrikaners super happy, and so they were like, "Meh." So, um, so in, in the '60s, South Africa became independent from from British rule, and then it became this like nationalist state. So we kind of went from British rule that wasn't all that awesome to this weird nationalistic state, and that was where they started to more formally introduce apartheid. But a lot of those policies were actually introduced under the Dutch. I mean, I'm sorry, under the, the, the British. And so they just sort of, the, the nationalists just kind of leaned into it. So they were creating homelands. I liken them almost to, I think, tribal lands in America is a fair assessment, right? Where they kind of put them into these pockets of areas. Usually, you know, it's not great arable land. It's kind of like, oh, we're going to put you over there and just pretend that's se separate but equal, which clearly it wasn't, right? So rightly, the Black people, uh, you know, and there were 11 
it's complex because like there are 11 different tribes depending on how you count in South Africa under the blacks, you know, and you have the Kosas and the Zulus and they hate each other. And so it's a lot, right? It's a lot for one little country. But um, so we had the 60s and then there was apartheid and then America and sort of the rest of the world was like, what are you guys doing? Kind of glossing over that they were doing that until like the mid fifties, sure. right? So South Africa in many ways was like 20 years behind America. So I would say like, I grew up in the seventies and eighties and that was probably very similar to people who grew up in the fifties in America. By way of example, South Africa didn't even get television until I think like 76 or 78. So, you know, we we're just kind of behind the curve, so to speak. Um, so the world at large was like, we don't like these policies quite right. So sanctions started. There was definitely, you know, this movement bubbling up globally, you know, free Nelson Mandela, all of that. So I caught, a, caught the tail end of the demise of, of the apartheid regime was during the time I was in college, you know, working in law school, going, uh, doing legal aid cases in the townships on my own, which looking back, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure how safe that was. But, you know, I felt very strongly and have always felt very strongly about, uh, you know, liberty and human dignity and just letting people be there, you know, themselves. And Nelson Mandela was, of course, uh, tried, and he was in jail for a good 30 plus years. He was kept on Robben Island, which was an island just off of Cape Town. And as the economic pressures of sanctions, international sanctions, was having a really negative impact, of course, on the country, which was the goal, which, of course, we know is what happened in, you know, Iraq. You know, this is sort of a model we've seen repeated over time that doesn't generally end up that well. But um, but because of this giant international pressure, uh, Nelson Mandela was released in 94. Uh, actually, I think he was released in 93, and we had our first free and uh, fair elections in 94. And that was pretty exciting. I actually voted for Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Uh, old school people would be like, you voted for a communist. And I'm like, you know, okay. It's Mandela. Fine. I think I'll give you a pass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And, um, and, you know, then for a while, South Africa was sort of on a good path, and now it's kind of a mess again. But, you know, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> what, what was it like on a on a day-to-day -day basis growing up there? Were, there, were the schools segregated? Were, were, was there, did you interact with other races? What was, what was it like for you? How, did so, you so feel the, what was going on? Yeah, so the schools were segregated. Um, they also came up with, you know, governments will just come up with the stupidest ideas, right? So one of the weird things they did in South Africa was um, they, they classified people as white and black. And then we had a term, it was called colored people. That's not a denigrating term at all. And those are mixed race, black, white, mixed race. It's a fairly large segment of the population. And they actually identify with the Afrikaners or with the Boers. They also speak Afrikaans. And so, um, so, so we had in our school, and then for some obscure reason, Chinese people were designated as white, if our, no, Japanese people were designated as white and Chinese people were designated as colored or something. So anyway, they had this weird system. So in my school, by way of example, I, I, I went to an all girls school and it was segregated. So it was all white children as well as um, Asian children, uh, girls, I guess. Uh, when I started college, I was one of the first years where we actually had a uh, full open enrollment. And so that that was kind of cool. You know, I ran a little underground newspaper on, you know, and would write these plays that got banned everywhere. And, and it was a fun time, you know, I and, and certainly people always ask me, where does this passion for your activism come from? And I'm like, I think it's just the environment I, I was raised in. And then I would say, you know, it was a police state. Um, it didn't seem that bad for white people and obviously wasn't, ha you know, even like one tenth as bad. But, you know, there was population control in terms of having to show your papers to move from, you know, one area to another. Um, most of my interactions, frankly, were with, um, with staff or with, you know, uh, your gardener and your homekeeper and that kind of stuff is really the reality of it. Um, but one of the things people always lose sight of, and I think this is a problem 
problem in America now too, is you know people want to work, and if someone wants to work, we should provide those opportunities. And I think we look at a lot of those relationships through a exploitative lens. But I'll tell you, anyone who's who's struggling or in a country with a high unemployment rate, people are genuinely glad to have a job. You're not exploiting them, you're actually helping them. Um, so that was sort of the base of it. And then we just had crazy, I mean, it was, it was a mess there towards the end. I mean, there were various um, unauthorized border wars that were going on between South Africa and Angola, between South Africa and Southwest Africa. There were all these uh, communist parties that were surrounding America that were being funded, you know, by by the Russians at the time, because that's sort of that simulation, right? And um, and so it was just a very strange country, I guess, to grow up in. And then I actually had the the fortune, my dad was a diplomat, so he worked for the apartheid regime and I'm like, eh, that's not great, daddy. <laughs> um, but you know, we weren't raised racist. We were always very open. Obviously, if you travel a lot, you're just gonna be an accepting, I think, person. And so I had, I had the blessing of actually living all over the world as well. And that really informed my views because I was like, hmm, <laughs> okay, we could probably be doing some of these things better. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's funny because where I grew up, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. It was 99.9% .9 white, but I just, and maybe it was just the environment my parents raised me in. It, it race to me just never seemed. I had, I had posters of Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali on the wall. I listened to Jay Z. It, like it just, and I never thought of them as as something different than me. So right, it, it, and it so to me it's like it doesn't even take having to travel a lot. It's just it, somehow it's put in you to think this group of people is different than you. And, and I think it has to be injected into into someone, whether it's through the parents, through schools, through government. It just I don't think that's the inherent state of people is to is to mistrust someone just because they look different. I, I don't think it is either. And I think you're absolutely right. It's it's forces that find you know, either by dividing us, they can eke out different power structures, or there's usually a reason. And and I have a really good concrete example. I just got back from Honduras, where we hung out with some of our South African friends, and they have twin boys, and they uh, have never, like never, like race is just, it's never been an issue. And then they started school in California, a, uh, you know, at this year and the kids came home from school one day and they were like mom dad we're the oppressors we you know we're white we're you know and I was like man that's not right yeah. that's just not right because we're humankind right and and I like both those words <laughs> you know we're human and we are all the same in that sense and we should be kind to each other I don't know why all this well, I know why the division is being stoked in order for people to, you know, again, gain power or, you know, live out their little evil fantasies. Right. <laughs> so, was there a point that your parents were like, okay, they're, you know, they're starting to see some of these wars that are bubbling up. Were, were they thinking while you were growing up, hey, we should get out of here? Or was that was that your idea when you got older that, that you wanted to leave? Um, I, I mean, because I traveled a lot, I think I did know, uh, you know, if an opportunity presented itself, I would like to go other places. Uh, interestingly, like after 94, uh, there was a brain drain, right? So there were white people and, and actually a lot of colored people too, and black people who were economically could do it, where a lot of people were like, we think you know, based on what happened in Zimbabwe and other things, people were just like, we're going to leave the country. That was really never a conversation in our household. My sister is an occupational therapist and she got recruited. The schools in South Africa are amazing. They're really, really good. And so people get a good education there. And you can go from high school. Like I went from high school to law school and then it's a four or a five year degree. But there's none of this like undergrad thing. If you're a doctor, you when you leave high school, you have a pretty good classical liberal education and so she got recruited to come to america and um and they came out to visit and then they wrote me in for a green card lottery and that's actually how i came here so it wasn't that it was like this purposeful idea of i must escape uh, but i did know i i think i've always felt like 
I needed a bigger platform. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. And, uh, and, and so when I got that opportunity to immigrate, I was like, yes, I think the, the universe is telling me, do it, girl. <laughs> so, so it wasn't even like, would you have immigrated, let's say your sister was in Germany or, or England, would you have just gone wherever she was? Or was there something about the United States that you wanted to go to? I mean, I think that uh, depending on how bad things got in South Africa, I do know people go various different places. And a lot of people did go to England because of the English connection. Right. But I think for me, you know, America was just really this beacon uh, growing up. There was this real sense of, oh, this is a cool place. You know, this is when capitalism wasn't quite as frowned upon sure. as today. Um, you know, this is a pre-communist America, let's put it that way. <laughs> And so I did kind of know. Hey, you're the one who voted for the communists. So I know it's all my fault. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there was something about America that just always appealed to me in the sense, you know, because it is sort of the pop culture that you grow up with globally, right? Like everyone, I've traveled a lot, you know, and I've sit in like little coffee shops in Lao, you know, and they're still showing American sitcoms, you know, Friends is on TV or whatever. So there is that sort of sense of it. So I did think America would be the best place and 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 rightfully it has been. Uh, now, of course, I think maybe New Hampshire, I'm not sure the rest of America is savable, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I guess I, I wanted to come here. I think I would have left anyway, uh, and hopefully we can keep America free enough or New Hampshire free enough where I don't have to immigrate again. You know, because immigration also is something, I, you know, people don't really talk about this, but it's funny to me that people will say, oh, America has this systemic racism. And I'm like, does it? Because the number one country of people who want to immigrate here are Nigerians. And other than Nigerians who are princes who just want you to send them $7,000 before they give you a million bucks, they are very entrepreneurial. And Nigeria is doing insanely well in terms of Africa. And so I always say, you know, when people are like, oh, America is so racist, I'm like, why do all these black people from other countries want to come here? Because it's awesome. <laughs> right. And I, I have to say, those princes never pay up. So they maybe never do. <laughs> eight times a charm, but I haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> uh, this, this is, this is a, a very ignorant question, but I, I generally, when I hear people from South Africa talk, they have they have a type of a British accent. You, mm -hmm. I don't hear any accent from you. Did you did you lose that? Did you never have it? No, so it, it is interesting and never ever make this joke in Guatemala because okay. the CIA made a real mess there and I was in Guatemala and someone was like, why don't you have a, a, a typical South African accent like this or, you know, the fancy uh, British girls high accent. And I was like, oh, that's because I'm CIA. And the guy just looked at me and he was like <laughs> horrified. And I was like, okay, don't ever make that joke again. But it's actually because my dad was in the foreign service. They were in the States from 73 to 78. And that was, you know, my formative year. So I actually learned to speak English here. Oh, interesting. And, um, and did have a bit of a British accent, which we know because when I went back, my grandfather, my mom was like, why are the kids peeing so much? Like, what's up every time we go to grandpa's house? And then she followed him and it was, we were standing on the stoop on the porch at the back and he would go one more time and, and we'd have to go, grandpa, grandpa, please, can I have a glass of water? Cause he just <laughs> loved our accents. Yeah. And then I lost it. And then literally when I moved back here, you know, within three months, it just, I think it's those neural pathways, right? right? right. And it just came back. Now, my husband does have a much thicker accent. When I used to drink, it would come out late at night. Sure. And there's still a few words. But yeah, for the most part, it's just... Uh, I, I knew there was a story to it. Because anytime someone doesn't have the accent you expect, there's always some kind of story to it. it, it it's funny. Like I, You mentioned friends. I've met a lot of people, especially from, from India, Pakistan, yeah. who that they, you know, they come to America when they're young. And and I hear them talk when they're older, and they have like just a they speak English beautifully with no mm. accent. 
and, and I say, how did you how did you pick up speaking English like this? They say, well, I used to watch Friends. Yes. I, so especially people my age and a little older, yep. everyone learned English by watching Friends. They all sound like you know the girls all sound like Rachel and, and the guys sound like Joey or Chandler or Ross. And it's it, it's there's always a, a funny story.